We are here with Dr. Boaz Gano, uh, head of the uh, International Institute for Counterterrorism in Israel. Dr. Gano, uh, we use the term terrorism almost every day. Uh, it seems like a big ocean and, and not many people know exactly what this ocean holds inside. Can you define for us terrorism? Well, you know, I'm teaching students in Israel uh, this subject matter and uh, it takes me a few hours just to explain the complexity of the term. Uh, one thing that we know is that there is no one acceptable uh, definition which is widely accepted in the international uh, arena. Um, actually, there is one book, Political Terrorism, which is mentioning more than 100 definitions for terrorism that different governments and different uh, 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 scholars are using. I uh, usually stick to a very limited definition which says that terrorism is the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilians in order to achieve political ends. It has three legs in a way. It's oriented to achieve political goals, different types of political goals. It could be uh, religious political goals, it could be ideological political goals, uh, nationalism, uh, uh, separatism, and so on and so forth. It needs to involve violence, and it needs to be aimed against civilians. So on that matter, I differ between terrorism and guerrilla warfare, which could be done by the same people uh, in order to achieve the same goals, but it's aimed in order to attack uh, military targets and not uh, civilian targets. Our website deals with uh, homeland security. What is the uh, point where terrorism touches homeland security or vice versa? Actually, the concept of, mo of uh, uh, homeland security is, is a very modern one, and it was in a way created by Americans, by United States, by the American administration after 9-11 uh, by creating the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. And if we follow the logic of the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, it actually deals with two uh, main threats um, which is aimed against the uh, um, national security. And I refer to terrorism under the definition that I suggested before, which is man-made uh, uh, atrocities and also natural disasters uh, that uh, um, that might risk uh, the security of the people of that certain uh, nation. So, all in all, are uh, all the threats that might uh, endanger the security of uh, one, one nation can be, in a way, uh, regarded as uh, homeland security. Is terrorism rational? Does it have a rational basis? It's, it's a very important question because uh, uh, whatever answer we give this question would lead us to understand what are the measures that we need to adopt in order to counter terrorism. Because if the terrorists are rational, then you can have uh, some sorts of tools and, and the tool, uh, 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 some sorts of uh, measures. Uh, if they are not rational, you need uh, probably different other, and other measures. Um, for that, we need to define what is rationality altogether. And I would argue that the rational decision-making process is a process in which one, it could be a person, it could be an organization or whoever, uh, one is calculating costs and benefits of different alternatives and is choosing the alternative which in the eye of the beholder is more beneficial. What I mean here is that rationality is probably a subjective term and not necessarily an objective term. What you would regard as rational I might regard it as irrational or uh, have another uh, set of uh, or calculus that will calculate cost and benefit differently. There are two misconceptions uh, generally in reference to the rationality of terrorists and the, uh, there are opposite misconceptions. The first misconception believes that uh, the terrorists are irrational actors. They are lunatic. Uh, how can you explain in a rational manner a person who is ready to uh, commit suicide attack, to kill himself in order to kill others? Uh, it's irrational behavior, so-called. Uh, by the way, all the literature, all the research proved that this is wrong. Uh, they are, most of them they are, are rational. rational. Um, the other, the opposite uh, misconception is uh, those which believe that terrorists are rational but they attribute their own rationality to the terrorist. They would not do this because I wouldn't do that. My calculation is th that this would be counterproductive. They probably think along the same lines. We need to understand that terrorists have their own rationality. They have their own calculus of cost and benefits. It's, uh, a, different, it's a different set of, of, of rational um, 
calculations. Yeah, it's the same. It's not. It's not, it's not our set of, of exactly. rational calculations. Exactly. It's the same. It's the same apparatus, but the content is different. And uh, one of the biggest challenges of every counter-terrorist expert in the world, a governmental uh, expert or, or, or scholar or whoever, is to get into the minds of the terrorists. And by the way, I would say in plural. Minds, because minds. the terrorist of uh, the minds of uh, Al Qaeda terrorist is different from the mind of uh, Hamas uh, terrorist or Hezbollah okay. terrorist. So we need to get into their minds and understand their calculus of cost and okay. benefits. Uh, based on on what you just said, what is the main danger from the international terrorism now? Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, other organization. Can you put your finger on one imminent danger to the world and to Israel? I would say that the biggest danger is that we don't really understand the rationale of our opponents, but that's not the, the question okay. that you refer to. Okay. So I, if I would try to uh, uh, focus on one significant uh, process which is happening right now and in my view will breed the new generation of terrorism, I would go back to the uh, so-called Arab Spring. And uh, uh, what do we see today in the Arab Spring process? At first, we, we use the term Arab Spring because uh, we, we cling to that some positive connotation. Spring is a, is a positive spring. thing. But what we see, and it's a pattern that actually repeats itself almost in every country that experienced this process. What we see is that uh, the traditional leader is being removed, sometimes being killed on the way, and being replaced by whom? by some kind of uh, 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 combination of different types of Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood, even worse than that, Salafists, and uh, they are trying to lead with more success, with less success, their own country. Uh, but at the same time, we see breakdown of governance. We see enclaves of ungoverned territories which are being developed. You can uh, uh, see Libya for that matter, Yemen, uh, Sinai Peninsula, Sinai Peninsula and now Syria and you see that those places are being immediately filled up with whom? With those local and, and uh, international global jihadists and terrorists which are looking for these types of heavens, enclaves which are ungoverned, very dogmatic, very uh, fundamentalist in their views and they use this platform in order to flourish. On top of that, they are taking over the resources and also the military resources, the, the weapons and the munitions of the army of that country. So you ask me what is the growing threat, what is the immediate threat, I'm looking uh, at what happened in Libya and I'm very concerned because we see uh, a sophisticated weapon now in the hands of uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda of uh, the Maghreb uh, um, and uh, I'm looking at what is happening right now in Syria and uh, it's, in my view, it's a matter of time until uh, Assad regime will fall. And the question is not if uh, terrorists will put their hands on the very sophisticated weapons of Syria. And we are talking maybe about the biggest arsenal, non-conventional arsenal in the world, chemical and maybe even biological, that will fall into the hands of terrorists. The question is not if it will fall through the hands of the terrorists, but, but which terrorists and when. when. And the terrorists might be Hezbollah, or elements of Al-Qaeda yeah. which are very active. You just mentioned only Islamic organization or militia. Is the question true that terrorism is Islamic? No, no, definitely not. Terrorism is no more th than a tactic. It's a violent tactic to achieve political goals. Now, different groups are using these tactics in order to promote their, their goals. Right now, most of the terrorist activity worldwide are being conducted by Islamists and jihadists. You cannot cling terrorism to Islam. I see. The, those Islamists have found terrorism as a, a, the best tool in their True. minds to achieve their goal. Tomorrow it could be other type of uh, extreme ideologists, anarchists and fascists and communists and whoever. I see. And, a, and a very important uh, question. As an expert, to deal with terrorism, uh, what, what, what do you think is the best way, offensive or defensive? You know, it's a more than one million dollar question, uh, and and probably I would be I would be a diplomat and I would say both. It brings me to the fundamental understanding what is terrorism altogether. Terror, I call it the formula of terrorism. The formula of terrorism is a very simple mathematical formula that has two variables, two factors: motivation and operational capability. It means when you have a group of people that has both motivation to attack, to launch terrorist attacks and operational capability that allows them to materialize the motivation, then a terrorist attack would occur. 
From that we can learn what is counterterrorism. Counterterrorism is either lowering down, lo lowering down the motivation that leads to terrorism or lowering down the operational capability of the terrorists. The best counterterrorism policy needs to deal with both factors at the same time. So you need defensive, you need offensive, you need counter motivation measures, and many, many other tools in your basket. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonov. Thank you.